Thailand, one of the last countries in the world still in touch with its past, where ancient traditions can be fruitfully adapted to the pressing needs of today. A well-loved king, worthy successor to distinguished ancestors, who uses his ritual sanctity and his personal popularity to get things done that will improve his people's welfare. All this, the king, the country's traditions, the people's welfare, are threatened with communist invasion. But with or without communism, the king sees his role as getting on with a job that needs doing. The king's convoy in action. It leaves more or less every day when he's in the regions and covers about 30,000 miles a year. In spite of losing one eye after his motor accident as a young man, the king likes to drive himself very fast. He says that it helps him to feel the land, to sense intuitively what it needs. He plans the trips himself and decides when to stop. Once people know that the king is going to pass their way, they lay out carpets in case he might stop for the feet of a king are not supposed to touch the ground. This taboo, though no longer strictly held, is still exercised, particularly by the country people. The purpose of these tours is always twofold. On the one hand is the improvement in the people's welfare and the development which the king achieves, and this is certainly significant. On the other hand, there is his presence as king among the villagers. Before his visit, they may feel themselves neglected, in his presence, and after he has gone, they know that they are not. In one year, the king's convoy gave away to the rural poor 39,038 blankets, 30,778 towels, 31,010 monks' robes, 29,180 sweaters, 29,140 farmers' outfits, 20,340 children's outfits, 34,358 pupils' uniforms. One statistic the palace would not release was the number of lollipops given out, but it must be hundreds of thousands per year. The ladies-in-waiting act as social workers, taking extensive notes on every case so that each one can be followed up afterwards. This means typing up every night and a lot of work when the court has returned to Bangkok. <coughs> the king's chief information officer coordinates them. There are a great number of administrative points to consider. For instance, if they take a child from a place like this to hospital in Bangkok, they have to take its family as well and feed and house them. No previous king had ever even visited the Northeast. King Pumipun spent the first 10 years of his reign traveling very thoroughly through every district of the country so that he could see the problems in detail at first hand. This detailed knowledge now forms a base for rapidly expanding work in all kinds of development. Huh? 
Or was the encouragement, listening to their problems, helping them to help themselves? Did they have any particular problem they wanted no, you to? No, no problem. They were very happy. And uh, I asked in what tempo they, they were going, and they said uh, the name, and I looked in the, the map. And there was an a old uh, temple here, and they did not uh, remember the name. They seem to be very impressed with your geographical knowledge. Oh, because they are very happy when uh, somebody comes and knows about their village. But you go everywhere with this map, I notice. It, it never, not this particular one, but yes, there, there yes, is never a map from your hand. I try to have a map so that I know where I'm going. And they are happy when they know that the official map is, there is a, the village is on their map. Are there some occasions when people live in villages that aren't marked on your map or that have the wrong name? Well, that is what happened now. What, what, what is what happened? There's a village that has no name, and I put a name on it. What's the Royal Household able to do for the people on visits like this? If they are seriously ill, we, we take them to Bangkok and we give, give them the operation or the medicine they need, and they don't have to pay anything. We pay for all the operation and the medicine, and they follow them up until they are well, and we send them home. We give them the money to go home and look after their family also. After, when their mother or father is in hospital, we look after the children also. But who, who actually pays for all this help? Is every single bit of help paid for by the royal family? Yes. yes. Well, what about the medical teams who come? Surely they're paid by the government, the, some of the doctors no. who are coming around with you? They are volunteer doctors, but the medicine, uh, the royal family pays for the medicine. Why haven't these people, if they've got something the matter with them, why haven't they gone to the, the ordinary government medical health service or to the local government hospitals and tried to get help from them? There are very few government hospitals around here and sometimes it's a sensitive area. The government officers couldn't get in. The King's mother, Her Royal Highness the Princess Mother, founded her flying doctor service precisely to cover these gaps in government health care. Her eldest daughter, Princess Galliani, who works as a university lecturer, helps her mother at weekends. As a trained nurse, the Princess Mother is well qualified for this work. Now nearly 80, she remains remarkably fit and continues to work with great energy at a number of projects. But her influence in matters of health has been considerable. Neither she nor her son, King Pumipon, ever forgets that public health was the life work of his father, Prince Mahidun, who died whilst working as a doctor in the north of Thailand. The Flying Doctor Service was founded in 1969. Border Patrol police helicopters take the doctors into remote rural areas they would not otherwise be able to reach. Radio communication has helped to make the service available throughout the country. There are now more than 20,000 in the service, doctors, dentists, nurses, pharmacists and health officers. All are volunteers who work for nothing in their holidays or spare time, and they are desperately needed, for there is a great lack of trained doctors in the rural areas. The opening of a new hospital is a more conventional act of royalty. Every state ceremony is prefaced by a religious one.
Even in such conventional engagements as these, the king's workload is enormous. 826 official engagements last year. In other words, an average of between two and three engagements a day, seven days a week throughout the year. Both king and queen admit that they have very little time in which to talk to each other in private. Outside the hospital, the crowds wait as usual for a chance to see the royal family. The king will never allow a precise time schedule to be imposed on his day because he needs to be free to stop and talk with people as they present themselves. She has uh, eight children and five of them are still alive and she can walk and she can uh, see very well, she can do her homework, but she's a little bit deaf. Um, this is uh, her grandchild, <laughs> grandniece, and her youngest daughter is uh, more than 40, eight children. <laughs> She's, she's a little bit shy of the camera, so I tell her to, to smile. <laughs> These people, uh, the, the, young, the young girls uh, behind them said uh, they are really over 100 years old. They said that uh, they eat ordinary, but uh, they, they complained about being so poor and nobody looked after them. So I, I think we will we'll just uh, help the neighbors uh, to give some money to the neighbors to, to look after them. This one is totally alone. That's what she told me. Totally alone. But these two have uh, distant relatives looking after them. So far this year, volunteer doctors on the royal team have performed about 250 operations in this area, mostly for eye complaints. Many doctors in the Northeast have been killed by communists ransacking hospitals for medical supplies. Your Majesty, could, could you tell us about the lady you looked at who had the, the growth? She's uh, 21 years old and just married two years ago. And uh, she said this uh, growth grows very quickly. In two years' time, it's big like, like you saw it. And the doctor said it's a cancer. I don't know, what do you call in English here, sinus, where the sinus is? The sinus? The sinus. Yes. She has cancer and it is perhaps uh, the last stage and we feel very sorry but we are going to send her to Bangkok with the, what do you call radio? With For radio, radiation treatment. Radiation treatment. How about the small child you looked at? I think uh, uh, this child who had a hair lip. I think it can be uh, operated uh, here at Sukunakorn because we have so many good doctors at Sukunakorn Hospital, so it's all right. An official reception in the grounds of Pupan Palace. At these functions, everyone must take part. Guests are frequently asked to do some kind of turn. Now it is the ladies in waiting. They worked all day as social workers. Now at night, they must change and perform traditional Thai dance. Romeo and Juliet translated to Thai opera 
with Romeo played by one of the volunteer doctors. <laughs> With the king's many languages, there is rarely any need for an interpreter. There is a great tradition of hospitality among the Thais. The showing of hospitality to foreigners, like Giscard d'Estaing's brother, is considered important for its own sake. The king and queen received representatives of friendly countries, both formally and informally, turning state functions into personal affairs whenever possible. Um, I saw that blue, lovely blue. Um. A natural part of the royal family's job is to promote the country's crafts, culture, and special products, even at parties. The Queen is very much concerned to increase silk production throughout the country. And she makes a point of wearing Thai fabrics herself. These dresses are made of matni silk, which is the material woven in the northeastern part of Thailand. Before it was dying art, because it is so difficult to make it. It would take um, many weeks to make it. Have you noticed that a single piece of matni can have different color? Once you look at it, it seems um, the color of gold and if you turn it round, it has the reflect of mauve color. So that's the quality of Thai silk. The people in the north, northeastern part of Thailand is the big majority of Thai population. And that part is quite dry. There are often droughts. When I visited, I noticed that the people are wearing this but only a sarong. It is so beautiful and so different from other material. So I asked them to weave it for me. And now I've got the market in the Japan, and soon I hope to get the market in Hong Kong. In a sense, all official functions are, as it were, extras to the king's main job, his traveling development column. The convoy contains doctors, social workers, agricultural advisors, irrigation engineers, and other specialists as required. Which is more fundamental to the relief of the rural poor? Improved medical care for the sick, or better food for everyone? The two must go together. Better nutrition means better health. The king is well aware that Thailand could have enormously productive agriculture. The problem often comes down to making the best use of available water. There's either too little or too much. Wherever he goes, you will see soldiers. Especially near the border, there's always danger. A spotter plane flies overhead. This is one of the king's new dams. Irrigation is probably the aspect of development to which he contributes most. Apart from his boat with the rudderless engine, the king has designed dams and irrigation channels himself. He has initiated over 400 irrigation projects throughout Thailand, often combining them with the introduction of fisheries.
The king instigates these projects, draws up detailed plans, persuades the government to finance them, but continues to take a personal interest in their construction and development. With his quick grasp of the subject, he always makes his experts work hard. And though he seems able to master almost anything he puts his hand to, it is probably the many facets of engineering for which he has the most talent. The king carries a two-way radio with him at all times. He is said even to sleep with it. This means that he's the first to hear of any crisis. But he seems oblivious to everything as he concentrates on the job in hand. And helped by this water here. So this water we take here, and we must put a, dam, a small dam here so that they'll have water here. The most important thing is that they should have rice in this area, which doesn't have to, to be marketed. They eat it. They, it is their subsistence. They will be able to have self-sufficiency in rice here, which they don't have now because mm -hmm. last year, uh, two years before, it was dry, dry, no water. What do you think the communists, uh, communist insurgents are telling insurgents. people about schemes like this that you're involved in? Depends on the, the one. <laughs> Sometimes they will say that uh, they are the initiators of this scheme. Sometimes they will say that uh, this scheme is the devil's scheme. Depends on the, the man. <laughs> but, but in a sense, there's a bit of truth in that because uh, they might be claiming that were it not for all their action, you and the government you wouldn't like be doing ask, these things here. You would like to pose this question. This is a half truth. If uh, they were not there, they, we would not have the trouble. And we would have built this dam a long time ago. But if, uh, because they are there, we must take the trouble to come here. Because uh, the people who built this, they want to have some encouragement. You're saying that this is evidence that you're winning? Winning against what? Communist insurgency. Oh, I don't know. But we are winning against hunger. This is what we, we are doing. We are not fighting against people. We are fighting against hunger. We want to have them have a better life. If we make this and they have a better life, the people you call the communist insurgents will have a better life also. So everybody is happy. And so on into the night. Impossible not to be overwhelmed by the energy of this man who works round the clock for his people. What must he think of us, technology cosseted Westerners? The Queen told us that we could never capture his life on film because we, with our union rules, would never work the hours that he does. Such powers of concentration, such radiant energy. An army camp. These soldiers have been waiting all day for the king's arrival. That is often the case, but the Thais do not mind waiting. It is still such an honor to see the king. Presence to the soldiers. The hand flick which the soldier gives before he receives the parcel is a gesture of politeness made only to the king, queen, and royal princes or princesses of the highest rank. It is, as it were, a gesture of asking permission to receive direct from the royal hand. The king enters the command headquarters for secret discussions on the military situation, a room which our film crew was not allowed to enter. We are reminded once again that Thailand is at war. Tell us why you think it's so important to come and inspect a military position like this, please. They have an uh, important task to do, is to uh, keep the area safe, the territory safe, and in fact to help the people, because the people in this area is very, very poor. 
so poor. This is the place where it is called uh, so-called liberated area, one of the liberated area. It isn't red anymore, but still the fact is the people, is, the people are very poor still. So the soldier here helps to um, give them advice on how to grow their crops and how to look after their children. They are loved everywhere, the soldiers, I mean, because they don't fight with arms only, because uh, they have been looking after the welfare of the people most. In fact, they have won the heart of the people. I think that is the right way to fight the insurgents. What do you think the communist insurgents think of the royal family of Thailand? I don't know, but I think you can search some of them. I think many of them have come. And uh, many of, not, not this time, I met once a man just came down from the mountain. He declared himself a communist, but he said he loves the king too. So how can one <laughs> explain that? How can one call him <laughs> a communist or what? <laughs> I don't know. We, we met a communist defector this morning who said, we asked him what were the communists telling villagers about the royal family. And he said that the communists tell the villagers that the royal family are the biggest capitalists of all in Thailand. What do you think of that? I think uh, the people will decide what to call us by themselves. They will decide. So we'll let the people decide. These young men, they have chosen to serve their country in the rural area. I'm very proud of them. And he can sing beautifully. He can sing, he can beauti sing. beautifully. And he play guitar also. He loves the people as well. He loves flower. He's an artist as well, a soldier. I hear that uh, this evening you're going to see an exhibition of dancing. Yes, it will take about only 10 minutes, but uh, we are late, much too late. After the day's visible work and activities are over, the king can spend four, five or even six hours alone in his study at night, surrounded by teleprinters, radio sets tuned into police or army frequencies and other communication devices. He debriefs himself on the day, and plans tomorrow's trip. Could you explain what, what you're doing with his maps, please? If I see something, you see circles there, places that can be developed. And you can see a place there with a red that thing there, it's a kind of so for damming and for making a small reservoir. And then when there are the engineers, the irrigation engineer, I can uh, ask them if it is practical to do that. And sometimes they go and, uh, and inspect the place and can have a, a survey. On the spot. Why do you have all these radio sets everywhere, all these uh, receivers, transmitters, telexes? What, what are they all for? Well, communication. I think that you should know that radio is for communication. I don't have television here. Now, I've heard people say that this is your personal um, intelligence network. I wouldn't say intelligence, but uh, sometimes it is very, very useful. Sometimes when you know about uh, the news of some disaster hitting somewhere, you can 
help them very very quickly and that uh, speed is the, the most important factor so that uh, I, I get the news by the telex or the, by the radio most of the <laughs> what you hear there here is doesn't concern me it's sometimes there there is a murder somewhere sometimes I can have some news of they can they have caught a caravan of heroin or something like that it is better than to to listen to the broadcast or other things when you sit here by yourself for several hours every evening looking at your maps and, and listening to the radios is that because you are a lonely man or because you need to have some time by yourself after all the, the public side of your life outside? Uh, that is a question that can be answered in many ways. I'm not lonely and I have work to do. So I have to do the work. The way of me, uh, doing work is to, to have some concentration that is in some peace and then one can think more clearly. It is a way of preparing myself to be able to do whatever circumstances uh, will have me to do. I gather information by listening, I gather information by looking at the, the maps or at reading or thinking. And then when time comes, I have the, the material in, in my head. From this radio station in his Bangkok palace, Kitlada Villa, the king gives special broadcasts during any natural disaster such as floods or epidemics to launch appeals for the victims, as well as the more usual messages to the nation. In the grounds of the palace there is a school. It was started for the royal children. It is open to anyone intelligent enough to be accepted. There are over 350 children in every facility. The king is a firm believer in the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, which he links to his Buddhist principles. An important part of rural development is the building of rural schools. It has been very difficult for the government to do anything about this. Lack of roads makes it hard to reach the remote villages. The building of roads is often sabotaged and hundreds of teachers have already been murdered by the insurgents. The king decided to set up schools run by soldiers or border patrol police with the soldiers or police doing the teaching. First, this was just primary education, but now it has expanded to secondary as well. This school is in the process of being built by the local people themselves. Youth and education occupy a great deal of the king's attention. He makes a point of giving every student his degree in person, and on an average, he awards 23,900 degrees a year. How important is it for you that on this graduation day it will be the king who will be giving you your certificate? It means so much to me because my family teach me and teach my brothers and my sister that we must pay respect to him. We are very proud to be near him or to get something from him, like the degree. It's uh, very important to me because uh, we all feel, we all respect the king because he is the best king. My family and I and all the Thai citizens uh, respect to him because he, had, he has done a great beauty to, to, to this country. Uh -huh. He means very much to us. The students have given the king some of his most difficult times in his attempt to stay out of politics. Naturally, they have been the most vocal section of the country, the quickest to clamor for change. Over the years, the king's speeches on graduation days sound cautious notes. For instance, 
Not every established thing is rightly destroyed by violence, for what is put in its place may be worse. Real creativity can only be expressed by peaceful means. Expand your awareness, but use your knowledge for the development of the country as a whole. Not all students are happy with this. The students have been associated with the two occasions of greatest violence in Thailand during the 70s. In 1973, there was a student uprising in which 73 were killed. The demonstrations were against the corrupt military dictatorship of Field Marshal Tanom. On this occasion, the king had intervened on the student's side and Tanom was exiled. A constitution was drafted and there were three brief civilian governments. But with 55 different parties, parliamentary democracy proved extremely complicated. Then in October 1976 at Tamasat University, students gathered again to stage a mass protest against the return to Thailand of the ousted dictator Tanon. The student protest was brutally suppressed. 30 were killed. The riots at Tamasat served as a pretext for a military coup. It has been suggested abroad that after the riots in October 76 at Tamasat, the royal family were themselves involved in some way in trying to help different factions come together and that the royal family was instrumental in the changes that happened after those riots. Yeah, the royal family is in the limelight so that if we think something, we do something, they will look at it. If they look at it, it, is, it doesn't mean that we are playing politics. And now, if after, it is not uh, the October 6th only, any, any action, even when I'm going out to look on the site of a, a small dam or asking the people if they have had enough to eat this morning, I am beginning to play politics. I am accused of playing politics. But at that time, your son was hanged in effigy. 